Welcome to the Matching Ideas with Resources Networking Podcast, sponsored by GLM Financial, an accounting firm in Schaumburg focusing on providing professional accounting and business services to small and medium-sized companies throughout the Chicagoland area. I'm Tom Ghosh, business strategist with GLM. Today I'm talking with Greg Gabrielson of Unemployment Consultants Incorporated. He's an unemployment benefit consultant which specializes in working with businesses to make sure they don't pay too much in unemployment contributions to the state and represent the company with any unemployment claims. It's actually a very interesting conversation where I was able to learn more about how the unemployment contribution rate and claims work. How long have you been doing this? Actually, I've been doing it going on 29 years. Wow. Uh, my sister Carol actually started our business. Uh-huh. I think I gave you one of my cards when we met at the after hours yeah, time. Yeah, perfect. But I brought out that and a list of our services. Mm-hmm. So, um, and actually I've got yours here too. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I saved it. So, so my sister actually started our business in 1982 it was. Hmm. Um, and your sister's Carol. Carol Gabrielson? Mm-hmm. Do you know Carol? No. How did I know that? I think uh, I researched it or? Probably saw our website or yeah. something. Yeah. So how is it working together? Because that's a list of our services. Maybe you checked out our website. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's going good. We um, we work with all types of employers. We work with a lot of park districts mm-hmm. because they get, you know, they're prone to a lot of unemployment claims with their summer employees. They have a lot of permanent part-time employees. Most of the golf courses, or most of the park districts have golf courses now. Uh-huh. So they're prone to unemployment claims, but we work with a lot of car dealers. We work with a lot of manufacturers, a lot of nonprofit organizations. Nonprofits are good because you know they're on such a strict budget, and um, especially if they get any type of funding through the state of Illinois, every right. dollar makes a big difference these mm-hmm. days. So we work with a lot of nonprofits, um, manufacturers, car dealers. We even work with um, probably ten or twelve temporary services because they get unemployment claims sometimes on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we, we follow up, we protest the claim, we appeal the decisions if it's unfavorable, and then the, the next step is when they schedule an unemployment hearing. And part of our services, one of our employees, one of our reps, will always represent the employer during the unemployment hearing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we actually go out and train their managers on the unemployment law. And then the other side of it is kind of the bookkeeping, you know, keeping track of the charges, making sure they're charged for the claims they should be. Uh, A lot of times we find errors where the state is charging an employer for unemployment benefits for a claim that they're not chargeable on. Um, Or it could be someone who's returned to work and they've collected three or four weeks of unemployment benefits before they tell the unemployment office they're back to work. So not only do we do the education part of it, but we follow up on the numbers end of it to make sure that each year their, their unemployment tax rates are signed correctly. Okay. So what would um, what would be some kind of trigger point that would make me think to call you in? Well, anybody that has turnover. Okay. Um, anybody that's tried protesting their own claims and hasn't been successful. Mm-hmm. Usually we get a lot of referrals from our current client base. We have a lot of what I call mom and pop shops, you know, privately owned companies with maybe 40 to 100 employees. And, you know, they'll be talking to a friend of ours that owns a business and they get talking about unemployment. So people that have protested their claims and lost them, they get really irritated. Mm -hmm. The state doesn't do a good job explaining why they rule the way they do in in most instances. So uh, people that are just frustrated with dealing with it because it's time consuming. It's a lot of paperwork. Now the state's going to everything electronic and they've made a lot of changes in the last couple of years. But prior to that it was all papers, papers going through and back and forth on faxes and in the mail. Mm-hmm. So a few years ago I, I collected unemployment. So the process, how does that process work? So I was let go by a company that I sold um, credit card processing and um, w- It was the first time I was an employee ever, and my wife said, well, why don't you try to see if you can get unemployment? So I went online and filled out the paperwork and said I qualified because they'd put put enough into the unemployment that I qualified for. I I don't know how it all works. So how does that work? So are they they 
paying more because they because I'm collecting unemployment from that. Right. Okay. Yeah. What happens is uh, mm -hmm. every year. Well, there's two ways you can pay unemployment taxes. Most com co a company that's a for-profit business. Mm -hmm they get assigned what's called an annual contribution rate determination. Okay. This comes out in December. They usually come out December 1st. What this does, this sets your unemployment tax rate for the following year. Okay. And this is a copy of one of my client's actual tax rates. Each year they reassign this. The minimum rate for 2016 is 0.55%. The maximum is 7.75%. And what happens is an employer, whatever rate they're assigned at, they pay that percent on the first $12,960 an employer earns in each year. Okay. So, for example, this particular employer, we've, we've protested every claim they've had in the last three years. We were able to win every single one of them. So, this on this unemployment tax rate, where it says benefit charges, that would be what was paid out in unemployment benefits okay. for that quarter of that year. And then they look at your taxable wage base, basically your payroll. So in general terms, an employer that has a larger payroll, let's say you have 50 employees on your payroll, one claim is not going to make your rate go up as drastically as if you had like five employees. So each year they reassign this rate if they have employees collecting unemployment, the following year, those charges show up on your unemployment tax rate. So the more people collect unemployment and the higher your charges are, the higher your unemployment tax rate will go. In fact, this puts it in kind of perspective, Tom. If someone is at the max, the maximum tax rate is 7.75, uh -huh. Their average unemployment taxes per employee is over a thousand dollars per employee. Whoa. If they're at the minimum rate, your average unemployment taxes per employee is seventy-one, just over seventy-one dollars. So there's a big variance there. And employers that don't follow up on their unemployment claims, if the employer doesn't protest it, and the person files their claim, the claimant can pretty much tell the unemployment office anything they want. And unless the employer responds or protests the claim, the state agency will just take what the claimant says and base their decision based on that. Huh. So, for example, when you filed for unemployment, you know, if you said you were discharged because you're, you know, the supervisor didn't like you or whatever, um, they would send a claim notice to your employer. If your employer does not protest that, then they, all they have to rule on is your side of the story. Hmm. And a lot of employers over the years have protested claims and they lose them for whatever reason. Then they get irritated and then they think it's just a no-win situation. Um, so clients in that type of a situation is, a, is really a good lead for me. Right, okay. okay. So basically how it works is the employers pay, they, the employers in Illinois fund the unemployment program through their unemployment taxes. Mm -hmm. As an employee, you do not pay anything into it. It's not like Social Security. So a lot of employees that lose their job will file for unemployment because they think they've been paying into the unemployment fund. But it's strictly it's funded strictly 100% by employers. Oh. <coughs> and um, they do have to do they have to contribute that right employers? Yeah, okay. yeah. It's 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 not optional. All right. Yeah. They call it a contribution rate. I guess to give you <laughs> the option of paying it. But yeah, it is. It's it's a tax. Mm -hmm. um, you have to pay it, and the state if if you don't pay it or you pay it late, um, they they have penalties and hefty interest because a taxing employer they make their court they make quarterly payments about a month after the quarter ends. Mm -hmm. So the quarter ends March thirty first or whatever. The you make your first quarter payment about the end of April, and when you start a new year your first quarter payment is always the highest because everyone's earning that twelve thousand nine hundred and sixty. Right. So once an employer, if they don't hire any employees after say June, their third and fourth quarter payments are usually pretty low and sometimes nothing if they've already paid on their twelve thousand nine hundred and sixty per employee. Gotcha. Okay. So where where we help the employers is by protesting the questionable claims 
and keeping those charges from coming on your record, that's what keeps your rate low. Um, I just recently started working with an employer that hadn't protested any unemployment claims. They're at the 7.75%. So what's going to happen is it's going to take a few years to get that old experience off their records. But they've been at the maximum rate for several years. And in talking to them, what I discovered was they were protesting their claims, but they weren't including all the right information. Uh, yeah. So protesting the initial claim, given the state the information they need to make their decision on, is kind of the key to it. Right. And then how do you end up charging them? We usually base it on the, the size of the employer, usually on the number of employees. Okay. Um, sometimes we'll look at locations. If they have, you know, locations throughout the state, we may look at that. But generally we're speaking number of employees. Um, most of our clients have locations only in Illinois. We have a handful of clients that have locations in Wisconsin, Indiana, Iowa. Um, we're look, one of my clients is looking to go into New Mexico. So each state law, each state has their own unemployment laws. Um, in some states, you can do what I do without being an attorney. I'm not an attorney. In a few states, and I'm not sure of all of them anymore, I think Missouri is still one, you have to be an attorney in that state to do this, um, to do this um, type of service for an employer. Wow. That's interesting. So we base it on the size of the employer because we try to get an idea. We never really know for sure how many claims we're going to get from an employer in one given year. Mm -hmm. So we look at their overall, the number of W-2s they had last year. If they can give us an idea of how many claims they've had, that helps us out too. Um, but like with the Greater O'Hare and, and Schomburg Business Association, you know, we're always willing to give a discount if we get a lead through, through one of those associations. Sure. And you work with um, payroll companies too? Um, we work with uh, some of the payroll companies refer us out to their clients like Amcheck, you know, mm -hmm. Katie, I'm sure. sure. Yeah, I work with some of Katie's clients. Um, we have some other accounts we've met over the years and some other payroll services that refers us out once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have one particular payroll service we work with um, because ADP actually, the large payroll service, they actually have their own limited program. It's not as detailed or as involved as ours is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you get their payroll, I think they give you a break on their unemployment, and I think they protest the claims. I'm not sure if they represent the employers at the hearings. The one thing that helps our clients out is we actually go out to their location and train their managers on the unemployment law. Right, so that they can kind of nip it sooner. Yeah, yeah. So if they have a bad, you know, if they have a bad employee, they know what to document so that they have to terminate them. We've got everything we need. Mm -hmm. um, some of our clients, we teach them if you, you know, if you realize it's not going to work out, the sooner you let them go from an unemployment standpoint, the better. A lot of our clients are in the habit of reviewing their new employees real, you know, real thoroughly in the first three weeks. And if they're not catching on to the job, they usually let those people go and find a new employee. Because if you let the people go before you're chargeable on that claim, they could collect unemployment, but it would not be charged back to the employer. Oh, I see. Hmm. Most of the time, a, an employee has to work 30 separate working days for an employer to make them chargeable. And one thing that never denies unemployment is if you just fire people because they don't have the skills for the job, or it's just a performance issue, they just don't work fast enough, or they're not doing a good enough job. So we get our clients in the habit, if you see it's not going to work out, and you see that in the first three weeks, take your action, if you see it before they work 30 working days, then you definitely want to take your action before you become charged. Sure. That's good information. And a lot of them, a lot of times when I go out to talk to a client, they'll say, you know, they'll hand me a file. I protested this case. I did everything I was supposed to. And I'll read through it. And sometimes it's just the way they phrase things. Uh, sometimes it's because they didn't give the unemployment office the information on the last incident that got them terminated, because mm -hmm. that's usually what the state's looking at. Um, or, for example, when there's an unemployment hearing, um, they're all done by telephone. We represent our clients at the hearing, so we're on the phone with them. Um, but if you don't have the first-hand witness, if it's someone that has hearsay testimony, you're always going to lose. And so what I've found with employers is, the supervisor will see something that causes me to be discharged, 
the hearing will come up, but they won't have the supervisor on the phone. They'll have the HR manager. Well, as soon as the judge doing the hearing realizes they didn't actually see or witness that incident, they rule it's hearsay. Hearsay can be admitted, but they will not use hearsay to make a decision. Hmm. There's a lot to it. I never really thought about it. Yeah, like, for example, with your case when you got discharged, if they told you it was just poor performance, then if he protested your claim, you still would have gotten your own employment. If you were always late to work after prior warnings and the last time you're late is beyond your ability to control and they fire you, the state would more likely give you your unemployment if that final incident was beyond your ability to control. Hmm. Interesting. So it's, it's a case-by-case -case deal. Um, a lot of employers also think if people quit, they're never going to collect unemployment, and that's not correct either. Okay. If somebody quits for a reason attributable to the employer, they're allowed unemployment. Like if you hire someone and you start them at $10 an hour and you cut them to $9 an hour, any time you change the terms of their hiring agreement, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a potential paid unemployment claim. Interesting. Thanks for listening to the Matching Ideas with Resources podcast sponsored by GLM Financial. I'm Tom Ghosh, business strategist with GLM, steering direction, matching ideas with resources.